day presentation. I'm delighted to be here talking about Bertrand Russell, uh, in particular his life in the 1930s, uh, through a very extensive uh, correspondence that he carried on with his second wife, Patricia, uh, at this particular point in time. Now, if we had been in person in Ottawa, uh, I would have spoken extemporaneously uh, because I'm someone who likes to move around frantically at the front of a room, uh, but because we're here uh, with me appearing in a one inch by one inch uh, frame in the upper right hand corner, uh, I have uh, worked from a, a prepared text this evening uh, just to kind of, I think it makes it a little bit easier um, to, uh, to, to get through. So I'll divide the presentation tonight into two different parts. We'll talk a little bit about Bertrand Russell in general, his life, an overview of his life, and then we'll move to the 1930s in particular uh, to look at a few elements of his, uh, of his correspondence with Patricia Russell at that point in, in time. In terms of his general life, you can break, break it down into three separate parts. The first from, 19, from 1872 to the onset of the, of the First World War. Russell was born in 1872, the grandson of Lord John Russell, one of the leading prime ministers of the Victorian era. Raised by his grandmother after being orphaned at a young age, Russell received his education through private tutors before he went up to Cambridge University in 1890. Cambridge proved to be a formative time in Russell's life as he worked with leading philosophers and mathematicians and participated vigorously in the famous Cambridge discussion group, The Apostles. Working initially on a five-year fellowship at Cambridge beginning in 1895, Russell became one of the leading figures in the development of analytic philosophy before the First World War. He published his first academic book in 1897, an essay on the foundations of geometry, and produced more searching scholarship on the logical foundations of mathematics in the principles of mathematics in 1903. Following this, Russell collaborated with Alfred North Whitehead for nearly a decade to attempt to demonstrate that all theorems of mathematics are derived from logic. The result of this work was Principia Mathematica, published in three monumental volumes in 1910, 1912, and 1913. I imagine no human being will ever read it through, Russell observed privately, and much of the text is indeed impenetrable to anyone outside of a narrow range of specialists, including me. Uh, I have no training whatsoever in logic or philosophy or math. Uh, Principia Mathematica, as you can see on the slide I've posted here, uh, it's filled with this complex notation, uh, really trying to understand the, the basic roots of, of mathematics. So hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of pages of uh, this complex uh, form. Uh, I always uh, chuckle at this line in Principia uh, after all of this um, logical notation. From this proposition it will follow when arithmetical addition has been defined that one plus one equals two. So it takes a, a great deal of, of proof uh, in these very complex logical works uh, to understand how, how math uh, works. Russell later turned to the philosophy of mind and language, and he was moderately productive in spurts into the 1940s, but his pre-World War I writings were his academic pinnacle. So that's the first phase of his life, from 1872 to 1914. In the second phase of his life, Russell's efforts moved towards social and political activism with the collapse of his first marriage and his affair with Lady Adeline Morell, one of the leading patrons of the Bloomsbury Group. In World War I, he became a prominent war resistor and founded the No Conscription Fellowship, eventually serving six months in prison for writing against the war in contravention of Defense of the Realm Act regulations. Here on the screen is Russell's passbook from the First World War. Uh, again, the government very tightly controlled uh, what Russell could do. Uh, he was ineligible to speak in, in certain, uh, certain uh, areas. Uh, and again, he did serve time in prison. Um, at the end of the First World War for his anti-war activities. And he was also dismissed from his teaching post at uh, Cambridge University as, as well. Following the war, Russell launched on a course of social reform and became one of the leading socialists of the interwar period. He visited Russia in 1920 and met Vladimir Lenin, 
and he spent an extended time in China on a lecture tour. Russell gained international notoriety for his views on religion, education, and sex. Why I Am Not a Christian, for example, published in 1927, quickly became a, the primary anthem of atheists and is likely the most powerful statement on the matter down to the present day. With his second wife, Dora, Russell established the experimental Beacon Hill School in 1927, an initiative that fit in well with the expanding education reform movements uh, after the First World War, but one that placed remarkable burdens on his personal finances and exposed him to constant criticism for the school's progressive outlook. Russell earned his greatest measure of criticism in many circles for his views on sex and marriage, particularly through the 19 publication, 1929 publication of Marriage and Morals, in which Russell proclaimed his blueprint for a new morality that would, in his view anyway, wash away millennia of traditional ideas about sexuality and family structures. These views, of course, earned Russell condemnation within conservative circles, and all of this notoriety and a messy divorce from Dora Russell eventually left Russell broke, shunned by English society and scraping together a living through journalism and writing potboilers. Russell, in, for, in fact, was forced to move to the United States in 1938 securing a one-year appointment at the University of Chicago before he moved to the University of California at Los Angeles for the 1939 academic year. Wanting to move back to the East Coast of the United States, he accepted a job at the College of the City of New York in 1940. But in one of the most well-known academic freedom cases in American history, the appointment was overturned by a New York judge who condemned the position as a chair of indecency. Again, Russell was uh, notorious for his, uh, his social and cultural views, um, you know, loved by many, uh, but, uh, but despised by, by many others as, as well. Russell experienced further difficulties during his stay in America. Uh, he thought his financial problems were over after he secured employment as a lecturer at the Barnes Foundation in Philadelphia. Albert Barnes had made a fortune after patenting Argyrol, an antiseptic used to prevent blindness in children, and he used his money to acquire the world's greatest collection of Impressionist art. But within a year of Russell taking up his post, he was fired by Barnes and was returned to penury, although Russell eventually did win a wrongful, discussion, a wrongful dismissal suit uh, against uh, Barnes. So that's the second phase of Russell's life then, from the start of the First World War to 1944, uh, he removes himself largely from the, the academic arena and becomes you know, quite a controversial but very popular uh, spokesperson for a variety of social um, and, um, and cultural causes uh, at this particular point in, in time. The third phase of his life begins in 1944, when from this dark place, Russell returns to the heights of British society um, after he is accepted back into Cambridge University in 1944. He became a leading member of the British establishment, eventually awarded the Order of Merit in 1949, given to only 24 living members uh, of British society, and he also won the Nobel Prize in Literature uh, in, in 1950. In the 1950s, Russell uses this influence to become a leading international champion of disarmament. He collaborates with Albert Einstein uh, in the mid-1950s in terms of warning the world about the dangers of nuclear warfare. And he also is pivotal in forming the Campaign for Nuclear Disarmament, the Committee of 100, and the Pugwash Movement, even returning to World War I practices by serving time in prison for civil disobedience in 1961. Here's the the humorous, camp, uh, the humorous editorial cartoon from the Evening Standard in 1961, again, you know, portraying this uh, nearly 90-year-old Russell as the, the brains of the prison, essentially, uh, at this particular point in, in time. Russell became more controversial in the 1960s and became a strong critic of American foreign policy. Uh, one of his most publicized efforts was his attempt to seemingly mediate the Cuban Missile Crisis, 
while the Cuban Missile Crisis was transpiring. He was writing all of the major leaders in the world, including President Kennedy, John F. Kennedy, and including Premier Nikita Khrushchev, you know, trying to get them to kind of uh, uh, damp down the, the tensions that arose during the Cuban Missile Crisis. It's debatable how much Russell was involved in the eventual settlement of the crisis. He certainly thought, you know, he played a, an influential role uh, in the um, stepping back from the brink of nuclear warfare. Um, and it's in an interesting book called Unarmed Victory uh, that Russell author, authored at that particular point in time. He also establishes the International War Crimes Tribunal to investigate the conduct of the United States in the prosecution of the war in Vietnam. Russell eventually dies in 1970, um, nearly 98 years of age, after leading, you know, truly one of the most remarkable lives in British history. So with this general overview of Russell's life in mind, let's go back to the 1930s and focus more closely on various aspects of Russell's experiences in this decade, taking advantage of new primary sources that are now available. Russell is one of the most studied individuals of the 20th century, and this scrutiny is, if anything, increasing as we move toward or forward more than a century after the publication of Principia Mathematica and five decades after his death. This academic interest in, in Russell is obviously related to his importance in terms of his impact in the field of philosophy and his social and cultural viewpoints that generated widespread acclaim and criticism. But this scholarly interest is also due to the, the voluminous archival records that exist relating to Russell. His prodigious output as an academic and journalist has supported the comprehensive and scholarly collected papers of Bertrand Russell that is printing all of Russell's non-publications, non-book length publications in what is estimated to be a 35 to 40 volume collection. Here on the screen, you see the kind of the first third or the first 40% of the collected papers of Bertrand Russell. Um, this is the project that I'm involved in at McMaster University. Uh, we're about halfway through. It's taken about 30 years to get to this stage. Uh, and we likely have another 25 or 30 years to go. There's that much stuff. There's that much available documentation on Russell's life and writings. This editorial project and a host of other Russell-related scholarship are also relying on the incredible range of correspondence sent by and to Russell during his long life. The database documenting this correspondence called Bracers, held in the, in the Russell archives at McMaster University, contains more than 130,000 entries including nearly 45,000 letters written or dictated by Russell himself. Some of those are duplicates, but uh, again, the majority of those 45,000 letters are indeed um, you know, sole, you know, sole source uh, pieces of, of correspondence. And this collection is constantly growing as more letters are discovered. Every day, every week, it seems, we're, uh, we're finding new Russell material uh, to add to to Russell's archives. In addition to the collected papers volumes, my research focuses on a recently released collection of letters Russell exchanged with Patricia Russell, an Oxford University history major originally hired in 1930 as a governess to Russell's children and then his third wife beginning in 1936. This correspondence, nearly 500 letters in total, had been embargoed for nearly 40 years after the Russell papers had arrived at McMaster in the late 1960s and early 1970s due to restrictions that required Patricia to have died and the expiration of a five-year waiting period. Um, Patricia herself lived into her, her 90s. You know, her, uh, her records were, embar were embargoed uh, well into the 2000s uh, before being released. These marvelously detailed and thorough letters, you know, some of the best letters Russell wrote and received uh, come as part of this, this package of correspondence. And they provide new insight into Russell in the 1930s. 
Um, and again, keeping in mind the theme of new material still available, Patricia Russell has also deposited her own papers uh, in a British university. Uh, they won't be open until the death of her um, longest lived grandchild. Uh, so there's still, again, all of this great new material that's uh, still out there waiting to be accessed by scholars. So in the rest of our time this evening then, I'll use this rich correspondence in the 1930s, and I'll focus on three Ps uh, to kind of frame uh, this, this discussion. We'll use this correspondence to examine Russell's personal life, his professional life, and his political life, uh, all to hopefully add some um, kind of color and character uh, to what we already know about Russell and his life in the 1930s. Most of the letters, or many of the letters in this Patricia Russell, Bertrand Russell series are written during Russell's major lecture tours that he undertook uh, during the 1930s. A major tour of North America in 1931, a tour of Scandinavia in 1935, and another tour of the United States in, in 1930. Uh, 39. And these tour letters really form the basis of uh, much of what we know about Russell and Patricia during the 1930s. So in terms of the personal aspect of Russell's life, uh, Russell's tour, tour letters, especially in the 1931 case, a uh, lecture tour case, demonstrate the remarkably complex and fluid nature of his personal relationships with Dora Russell, his second wife, and Patricia herself, uh, with whom he had commenced a sexual relationship immediately upon her arrival in Russell's household in 1930. Now, existing scholarship that didn't have the, uh, the benefit of this remarkably rich correspondence tends to portray Russell's relationship with Dora Russell, his second wife, in an irreparable state of decay and his ties to Patricia inevitably deepening at this, this time. Certainly Russell's marriage to Dora was in trouble, um, but just how in trouble it was is, is subject to some debate here in this period. And these letters that Russell exchanges with Patricia really help us clarify where Russell stood personally uh, in the early 1930s. In fact, the 1931 tour letters convincingly demonstrate that Russell remained very conflicted about the direction he should follow. The balance of evidence in these letters indicates that he might have even tilted in the direction of trying to salvage his relationship with Dora instead of moving forward with Patricia. In the last few weeks of the tour, Russell informed Patricia that he had long that he had long-standing concerns that she might leave him to marry a younger man. Again, there was an enormous age gap between Russell uh, and um, this Oxford undergraduate student. Uh, in the early 1930s, and that it would be a mistake, Russell wrote, to build on the assumption that our relations were permanent. In the same letter, the one that's printed on the, or shown on the, on the screen here, Russell also complains of Patricia's occasional cruelty, a sentiment reinforced in his private memoirs, written nearly 20 years later, in which Russell claims she became prone to hysterical outbursts of hatred against him. Russell, Russell subsequently informed Dora during the tour that he wanted a permanent relationship with her. I had some grievances some time back, he wrote to his wife, but I have none now. Russell continued to move in this direction after he returned to England, but ultimately Russell does reverse course and determines to cast his lot with Patricia. Nonetheless, these letters, again, newly released letters um, for the 1930s and 1940s exchanged between Russell and Patricia, you know, really help us understand in a much more comprehensive fashion what exactly is going on here. Further insights into Russell's personal relationship with Patricia is provided by the correspondence they exchanged during Russell's 1935 lecture tour of Scandinavia. Again, lecture, uh, Russell was making a lot of his money at this particular point in time by constantly lecturing. Uh, again, he didn't have an academic appointment. He was basically forced to 
uh, become a journalist, uh, write as much as he could, and also go on these extended speaking engagements um, in, in various countries in the, in the 1930s. He did this most of his life, in fact, uh, up until the, the 1950s. So more insight into Russell's personal life can be derived from the letters exchanged by Russell and Patricia during this 1935 tour of Scandinavia. Now these 1935 letters, again, were four years on from the, the US lecture tour. Uh, they certainly reflect the love that Russell had for Patricia, but this correspondence also reveals the contesting and competing forces affecting their romance. Patricia's seemingly incurable health problems were an obvious source of concern for Russell. The letters also highlight pers Patricia's persistent contact with former lovers and document Russell's tryst during the tour with a previously unknown individual named Weta Forchammer. Forchammer was a former teacher at Beacon Hill School with whom Russell had an affair. Russell went to Scandinavia with Patricia's direct instruction that he was not to have any interaction with, with Forchammer. Uh, Russell, as usual, uh, simply couldn't keep to those, uh, those promises. And when Russell does inform Patricia that he had slept with Greta Forchammer, she wrote a remarkably painful and emotional letter to Russell that, explo that exposed her deep sense of betrayal. I've included an extract here on the left-hand side of the page. Patricia wrote, the contempt and loathing that I have felt for her way of life, Greta's way of life, have been so strong that I feel now you could not more crudely and flagrantly have hurt me. I have tried so hard to live in a decent and good way, sacrificing little things for big ones. And this seems as if you must have deliberately intended to mock me. I am sorry that you don't feel genuine remorse because you ought to, not because you have been wicked only unworthy. So again, these remarkably you know, emotional letters that are going back and forth between uh, Bertrand Russell and Patricia, Russ Patricia uh, at this particular point in, in time. This scathing letter led to one of the few extant apologies Russell ever issued during his entire life for his frequent infidelities. And the letter's printed here on the right-hand side of the, of the screen. The letter, the letter I just quoted, I had been dreading came today and was just as in my bad dreams. I have been a fool to cause you and me unhappiness from a moment's weak good nature. I have no heart to say more at the moment. Although Russell and Patricia would marry in January 1936, shortly after Russell's return from Scandinavia, the infidelity and tribulations recorded in their correspondence during the 1935 tour revealed the shaky foundations of their relationship and provided an ominous preview of difficulties to come. So again, there, there's enormous detail here in these letters. Uh, we only have a few minutes here tonight, but I think they certainly do shed considerable light on Russell's frequently tumultuous personal life in the, the 1930s and 1940s. These letters just briefly also touch quite heavily on Russell's professional life, the second P that we're looking at tonight. Russell basically returns to philosophy or attempts to return to philosophy in 1935 and 1936. He was hoping for an academic appointment basically. So he wanted to kind of regain his, his academic status uh, in the, uh, the international philosophical community. So he uses this 1935 Scandinavian tour to roll out two brand new academic papers, uh, The Limits of Empiricism and Determinism and Physics. It should be emphasized that Russell received important feedback from leading scholars and scientists attending his lectures during this 1935 Scandinavian lecture tour, most notably the renowned physicists Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg. Um, again, this is brand new to Russell scholars. Before these letters between Patricia and Bertrand Russell were um, lifted or uh, released from their embargo, we didn't really know anything 
about what he did in Scandinavia in 1935. Um, he makes one kind of side reference to his Scandinavian tour in one newspaper article he wrote. There's a little bit in Danish sources from the um, the tour organizers uh, that were based or who were based in Copenhagen. Um, but these letters really provide terrific detail about what Russell is thinking about, what he's doing in terms of trying to get back into the philosophical game at this particular point uh, in, in time. So again, he meets with Niels Bohr and Werner Heisenberg during his Scandinavian lecture tour. We had no idea that had taken place um, before. Before lecturing on determinism and physics in Copenhagen, Niels Bohr had personally expounded his views on quantum mechanics directly to Russell. The result of his lecture, Russell noted to Patricia, is that what I had prepared on determinism and physics won't do. And Russell revised and delivered this paper for the first time on October 10th in Bohr's presence, as he claimed, without disgracing himself. Uh, two days later, uh, Russell also meets with Werner Heisenberg uh, for an extended uh, interview, an extended uh, conversation. Um, and again, we, we never realized before that uh, Russell was meeting with these eminent physicists uh, who were working uh, in Europe at this particular point in, in time. So you can see from the, the photographs here from letters first on the left from Russell to Patricia, and then the extract from a letter um, of Patricia's to Russell uh, on, on the right. Um, these letters are important because they tell Russell scholars uh, that Russell, in fact, did understand quantum mechanics. There's, there's not much written in Russell's work about uh, exactly what he knew about quantum mechanics, and some Russell scholars have said that means that he didn't really understand all of these major developments in physics that were going on at this particular point in time. But these letters, in fact, conclusively prove uh, that Russell was intimately familiar with the notions of causality, the notions of quantum mechanics, uh, as a result of his Scandinavian tour. If you look at the third paragraph, for instance, on the, the left-hand letter here, uh, here's Russell saying, after lunch, uh, I having said I couldn't understand his present, this is Bohr's, this is Niels Bohr we're talking about, I couldn't understand his present controversy with Albert Einstein. He took me up to a blackboard and lectured for one and a half hours brilliantly. I at last understand and became entirely persuaded that he is right. The matter concerns causality and it is grave. So again, these letters, now that they're released, are really showing us a lot about what Russell's professional life was like here, adding a lot of uh, quite remarkable context to what is going on in terms of Russell's um, academic perspectives, his academic outlooks. Um, and we now know that he did in fact fully understand these matters that were consuming the world of physics uh, in the, the mid 1930s. So the letters help us understand Russell's personal life in the 1930s. They help us understand Russell's professional life in the 1930s. The letters also help us understand Russell's political views in the 1930s. By the mid 1930s, Russell had established a reputation as one of the leading anti war activists in Britain. And building on his record of peace activism during the First World War, he was actively engaged in mainstream organizations such as the Peace Pledge Union. In 1936, Russell published a strident pacifist manifesto titled Which Way to Peace? In Russell's view, the destructive nature of modern war mandated the adoption of national and international pacifism. in the face of the growing threat of, of Nazi Germany. Accompanying this, Russell believed that England should give up all colonies and disarm completely, thus making the country of no importance to Hitler. Having no longer large armed forces, Russell wrote, we would threaten no one, and no one would have any motive to make war on us. Probably, if we had neither armaments nor empire, Russell continued, 
foreign states would let us alone. If they did not, we should have to yield without fighting, and we should therefore not arouse their ferocity. Even if Germany did invade Britain, Russell maintained, Britain could overcome what is harsh and silly in the Nazi philosophy by offering no resistance whatsoever. Now, obviously, in the light of the terrible events of the Second World War, you know, many of these pacifist prescriptions seem, you know, quite silly in, in, in some respects. Uh, and indeed, uh, Russell himself was somewhat embarrassed by which way to peace uh, in the aftermath of the, of the Second World War. But it's important to note that in 1936, when Which Way to Peace was released, um, it was widely supported. Um, many people in British society were having these exact same uh, viewpoints or holding these exact same viewpoints as, as Russell was in 1936. So the important thing to consider is, how long did Russell hold these pacifist viewpoints? You know, did he abandon them in 1937, 1938 with Munich, 1939? The letters exchanged between Russell and Patricia once again help us understand uh, what, was, what was going on here. As indicated earlier, Russell moved to the United States in 1938 to take up a short teaching stint at the University of Chicago before moving to the University of California at Los Angeles in early 1939. Here's a picture of his, his family here at 212 Loring Street, uh, just off the UCLA campus. His third wife, Patricia, uh, his two older children, John and Kate, from his second marriage to Dora, and Conrad Russell, the, the young child sitting in, in Russell's lap um, that had been born shortly after his marriage to Patricia in 1936. So he's moving to Los Angeles. Uh, once again, he undertakes a very detailed and exhaustive lecture tour of the United States in April of 1939. And using these letters between Patricia and Bertrand Russell, we see Russell's viewpoint on pacifism in this particular period of, of time. One of the most important influences on Russell at this point was a woman named Frida Utley. Um, Utley had personally experienced the depravity of Stalin's rule in the Soviet Union. Um, she escaped the Soviet Union after her husband uh, had been caught up in the Stalinist purges. Uh, and she eventually moves to the to the United States. At this point in time, Utley shares Bertrand Russell's pacifist, pacifist viewpoints uh, quite uh, quite strongly. And he meets uh, on several times with uh, she meets several times with Russell during his 1939 tour, and is kind of bucking him up in in many respects. Uh, she's convincing Russell that pacifism is indeed the best way to go. And even as late as April 1939, again, after Munich, after the uh, German invasion of uh, the rest of Czechoslovakia, um, Russell is still basically maintaining his pacifist viewpoint, even though war is on the immediate horizon. Russell writes back to Patricia after a number of engagements with Frida Utley. She confirmed me in pacifism. Russell reported in a letter dated 13th April, uh, 1939, have that here, um, which at bottom, when I can forget the chessboard, I always come back to. That, that's a really important uh, phrase from Russell there. Again, he might have been wavering a little bit as the specter of Nazism seems to be washing over Europe, but even in April 1939, he's still adhering to the pacifist view. In the same letter, again, another extract here, Russell recounts his debate the previous night in Baltimore with Maurice Hindus, a Russian-American author and journalist. I set out the whole case for pacifism. I spoke better than I have ever spoken before, all the better because I shared the doubts and hesitations of the audience. People said they could see me thinking when I spoke. I quite convinced myself at any rate. So in the interest of time, we're just gonna skip over a slide or two here. Um, again, these letters are demonstrating 
Russell's commitment to pacifism um, as late as, you know, April, May, June of 1939. You know, something that Russell scholars have uh, traditionally been grappling with when they try to come to a better understanding of what Russell was thinking about at this particular point in, in time. Russell's correspondence with Patricia, therefore, provides important insights into his political views and the strength of his pacifist thought. He would, of course, eventually move away from pacifism and fully support the Allied war effort, although the process was gradual. As late as December 1939, again, four months into the war, he maintained that I try hard to remain a pacifist, although the thought of Hitler and Stalin triumphant is hard to bear. The invasion of France in May 1940 finally forced Russell to publicly announce that he was rejecting pacifism, and a detailed personal account of this change in his views appeared in the New York Times in February 1941. I have changed my own opinion as the evidence has changed, Russell noted. It is a tragic alternative, but it must be met with such hope as the times permit, and with a determination that in winning the war, we shall not lose what we are fighting for. Sadly, Russell's relationship with Patricia that had showed severe cracks from its opening months could not last, and the two parted in an acrimonious split in 1949. But the nearly two decades of correspondence they exchanged nonetheless provides a unique window into their lives and add to the richness of our understanding of Russell's career and personal affairs. And just to close, ultimately the study of Russell remains relevant in 2020. It is truly instructive to note the similarities between the matters Russell and his contemporaries faced and those confronting us in the present day. The many issues Russell addressed throughout his life, regardless of one's personal perspective about Russell's views, and again, very controversial person, you know, personally, I don't um, adhere to, to many of kind of Russell's social and uh, political uh, viewpoints, um, but Russell's positions are still debated today. Russell's complex response to a decaying and precarious international order in the 1930s seemed perfectly seems perfectly aligned with challenges facing us in our own time. And the idea of Russell as a public intellectual providing clear and thought-provoking analysis of pressing political, economic, and social matters seems especially relevant in an age of social media disinformation and the widespread denigration of reasoned and informed approaches to these issues. This continuity, therefore, makes the comprehensive study of Bertrand Russell worthwhile and pertinent. So I'll leave it there then, and as Dominique indicated earlier, we do have time for a question and answer session. 